the topic I put first is the CARES Act. And I confess I didn't read all 880 pages of it, but I do think I know the content of it. And that's the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act that comes out with $2.2 trillion of relief related to COVID-19. It just became law last Friday, so everyone is scrambling to try to figure out exactly what's in it and what it means. With legislation, of course, there were some bills along the way, but they were all very fast, moving quickly and changing quickly. So it was only Friday that we saw what the final result was. Um, the uh, other two laws that have come out related to coronavirus are shown on page two of your materials. So an earlier one was March 6th, which was Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropri Appropriations Act. And that um, provided $8.3 billion for emergency funding for federal agencies. That's not something I cover here today because that only indirectly helps our parishioners, but it is not something that directly affects our church or our conference. The next um, act was March 18, 2020. And as you can see, all of these are very recent dates. And that's Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, now this, um, is something that is covered in the outline. So I put it after the CARES Act. That relates to paid sick leave or expanded family and medical leave for specified reasons related to COVID-19. Now I'm going to turn to the CARES Act and what is the most time sensitive part of this that I see, and that's the forgivable loan portion. Now, to my knowledge, there's nothing in the act that says forgivable loan, but that is basically what is being described in this portion of the act. So I'm gonna go into it in a fair amount of detail. All of the materials that I read and the webinar that I attended on Tuesday, which was geared toward lawyers and accountants, all have taken the position that the forgivable loan is available to churches. And according to my interpretation, also the conference or other um, church entities. The way that's um, concluded is because our churches are nonprofits and fit under the 501c3 category. Um, and the forgivable loan part of it relates to small employers of 500 employees or less, which again for our conference applies to each church. The reason I emphasize that that is the, you know, interpretation of virtually everyone is because just this morning at 7.04 a.m., I got an email from the interim general counsel of GCFA in Nashville, uh, Brian Mills, and he did discuss in that email how there are some questions being raised as to the eligibility of churches. Um, so you've heard it here first, but my suggestion to you is to not bandy about these different theories that might become problematic. Um, I think our presumption going forward should be we're going with the bulk of the opinions that say, yes, churches are entitled to the forgivable loans and proceed on that basis. Um, so your next question would be, well, what could be questioned about our eligibility? And I'll just give you a couple of examples. But uh, with any federal law that's quickly thrown together, apparently they didn't think of all the nuances. So there's gonna be 
more work in process, obviously, by the SBA creating regulations that specifically address these kinds of issues. One question raised is the fact that um, each church does not have its individual 501c3 um, blessing, so to speak, its own paperwork for that. And, and that's because, of course, we go under the United Methodist Church umbrella. Um, so we've uh, got our group exemption. We are 501c3 for all practical purposes. But the question has been raised, well, if we're all one group, then do we exceed the 500 on the employee front? So again, if we're going to your local lenders, you do not need to bring this up, but I just wanted to alert you that, that um, that's one issue that has been raised by um, at least one senator and one lender. So, so far it's only one lender and one senator. Uh, and if that is dealt with appropriately, we're gonna be all systems go. Um, in particular, in a letter yesterday, um, Senator Josh Hawley from Missouri sent a letter to the administrator of the SBA and he pointed out that um, the whole point of this law is to give benefit to churches um, and that the SBA should avoid arguments about um, that issue about 500 or less. Um, and here it gets into the typical characterization under a normal SBA loan that you have to identify any affiliates and then if you identify an affiliate and the total of employees exceeds a certain number, then you're tagged with that certain number. Um, obviously, one can say, aha, under our joint uh, exemption, we're sort of affiliated with each other. And so therein lies that issue. But then the senator who is clearly in favor of churches getting these loans so it was a positive letter, uh, pointed out that exceptions can be made. And an example was given of tire manufacturers who have a situation where they've been granted a 1,500 employee uh, limit. Um, so I don't wanna scare you, I'm just making it clear that if there's a hitch in the get along, you need to bring that to my attention so I can make sure that we get it into the hopper and direct things in a positive uh, direction, at least for our conference churches. Bottom line is, yes, each church is encouraged to apply for one of these loans. And um, certainly we're here to help you accomplish that task. Um, all small businesses apparently are gonna be doing that also. So it's gonna be uh, those who get to the gate soonest and run the race the fastest will win the money because there's only a set amount of money that is set aside for this purpose. And um, that means that time is of the essence. Okay, so back to your outline. This is a new SBA loan program, and the SBA is not accustomed to dealing with churches. Um, but this is a new program. It's called the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, PPP for short, or sometimes I just refer to it as the program. As I said, it's for those entities that have 500 employees or less, and it does specifically uh, contemplate nonprofits, um, and as we've understood it, churches. Um, the purpose of this law is to prevent workers from losing their jobs and preventing small businesses from failing due to economic losses caused by the pandemic. Now, the loan itself is basically a very easy one. It's unsecured which means it's a straight out loan where once you're accepted, you get the money. 
Um, there's no need for collateral, so you don't have to, you know, give a mortgage against your church. Uh, there is no personal guarantee required, so there's no need for um, any church member to say, oh, if this doesn't get repaid, I will repay it. Um, it's totally non-recourse. I put in some categories that I thought would be practical and useful. So the first category I put in is, you know, where to get the loan. And certainly if your church already has a relationship with a lender and that lender does SBA loans, that's your quickest route to getting the money. So I, I highly advise that. Um, the law says that in addition to those lenders who currently make SBA loans, there are going to be additional lenders who will be added to the list. Um, but my opinion is that because of the speed of this, um, again, you don't want to wait around for a lender to become approved. So if your relationship for banking purposes is not with an SBA approved lender, then I do recommend you find a different lender that in fact does do SBA loans. So there's a website in the material so you can look up the list and see who might work best for you. Um, Randy, did you also check with the United Methodist lenders? Um, yes, my understanding is that uh, Credit Union, United Methodist Federal Credit Union is an SBA lender and I've already submitted a uh, form, an application to them for the conference, so, uh, but they haven't gotten anything back yet. So as soon as they get from SBA the go ahead that they can start processing, I can let people know if, if you do bank with the credit union. Yes, that'll be um, a good test. If it works for Randy, it should work for your church also. There's no need to do any shopping around for a lender because the terms of the loan will be the same from every lender anywhere in the US. So, so you don't have to check rate or loan terms or anything like that because they're all going to be set in stone. Um, and that just became clear on Tuesday um, when Randy got the printout from the US Treasury Department. Uh, which spelled out certain rules that they have come up for, come up with for borrowers. And in fact, they're a little different than what the Act said. So when I found differences between the Act and what the Treasury Department said, I highlighted them in your outline here. Um, so to some extent, for example, where the Act says the interest rate can be up to 4%, which might have you know, cause someone to look around for the cheapest interest rate. In these Treasury Department materials, they say a half a percent, and that's it. It basically says that will be the rate. So then you don't have to do any shopping for interest rate. Um, I also attached an example of what came out from Chase for its business clients, because Chase is in a number of our states, and so that's information that can be helpful getting things started with Chase. Then the question becomes when to get it. And I can't emphasize enough, we can start applying tomorrow, April 3. So you want to get your ducks in a row, just like Randy's already done for the conference, um, and be all set to, to hit that button and get that application officially submitted. I'm sure that every lender will be just inundated. So hopefully you'll have some person maybe within the lender who's gonna be guiding your application to the right place if that's what needs to happen. There will be uh, an April 10 date for independent contractors and self-employed individuals. I put that in just in case you're advising a parishioner who is having financial troubles and you can say, hey, here's a forgivable loan. It's silly not to try to ask for this money uh, because it's really going to be free money if you just follow the simple rules. As far as eligibility, 
the church must show that it's been harmed by the pandemic between February 15, 2020 and June 30, 2020. Well, of course, it's just April 2nd. So how do you say you've been harmed when it's not June 30 yet? Um, one of the questions that came in related to this webinar, in fact, asked that question. It said, gee, what if we haven't been harmed yet, but we expect to be harmed? In the webinar that I attended on Tuesday, the speaker took the position that basically everybody has been harmed. Um, he went so far as to say law firms who might even make more money during this pandemic still can make the statement they've been harmed. I think his logic, although he didn't express it, might have been that all of us have had to change our practices of how we go about our ministry or, or business. So people are having to work remotely. Um, it takes time and effort to set those kinds of procedures up or it's more complicated getting the information you need. Um, I spoke with one woman who works at ASU and she said, well, she was trying to work remotely, but one of the documents she needed was at the office. So she had to go to the office to get that document to go back home to answer the person's question. So clearly there's an efficiency issue there. Um, having to close church campuses and then doing online ministry, sermons and otherwise, uh, certainly is an adverse effect. It is a harm, it's been caused by the pandemic. So no one considers um, this eligibility uh, requirement to be a problem for anyone, in other words, the idea is that everyone who fits under the category uh, that we've talked about already is entitled to this type of loan. Here is sort of the declaration. I'm now on page four of the outline. The declaration then goes through uh, basically what you're declaring. So certainly you can read that, um, but um, the U.S. Treasury has even come out with a more specific list that has the exact wording of what you will see. Um, but these are the categories that are covered by that declaration. The consensus is basically everyone in the U.S. who fits into this category uh, can say these things are, are true. As to the application process, um, there is required documentation, but it's pretty minimal. When you think of the huge number of loans that are gonna to have to be approved, it really has to be the basic yes or no kind of review done by any bank or other financial institution where they just basically have to have a checklist, have these things been submitted. One of the benefits of this program is that none of this decision-making will be sent to a loan committee. It's not like a typical loan where you have to submit all of your information and then uh, the loan committee decides whether you're credit worthy or whether it's a smart loan or not. These are gonna be pretty automatic once you get into the system. Um, so you just have to submit some basic required documentation, mostly centered on payroll and annual, annual revenue. Now, one of the questions submitted asked about, um, do you have to submit a financial statement? In all likelihood, the lender will want that. So I would say the answer would be yes, but what they're looking for, or the documentation you're really submitting is your annual revenue. So they're gonna be focused on annual revenue and payroll. So just think of what documents you have that cover those two main categories. Another question that came in was uh, where the application asks about a list of owners with 20% ownership stakes. Um, how shall a church answer that? Because there's no stakeholders, there are no shareholders. Um, it's my opinion that you can answer that as not applicable um, or, since no one would have more than 20%, uh, 
Um, you could fill it in with none for that matter. Another question that came in is, can the treasurer and business manager of a church sign as representative? The answer is yes, or um, more commonly perhaps is the chair of the board of trustees could sign. And you will want to have, you know, some minutes of the board of trustees um, saying who's authorized to sign. So if they have chosen the treasurer and business manager, that's fine. Uh, if they've authorized the chair of the board of trustees, that's fine too. But it's good to have minutes that back that up. And that's more a, a book of discipline matter. That's not for the lender's purposes. As to payroll costs, the main message I have on this topic is that it's not just salary or wages. This is a broad definition. And so it includes um, employee benefits, cost for vacation, parental, family, medical, or sick leave, um, allowance for separation or dismissal, payments required for group health benefits, insurance premiums, payment of any retirement benefit. The reason it's important to include as much as you can is because the amount of your loan is based upon how much you show. So that's an important thing to know. A question came in and asked this, uh, is the salary of the pastor eligible? Uh, here we fall back on the rule that uh, whatever the church pays in salary or wages is includable. And that's for a pastor, for example, um, who might be the highest paid employee in the picture, that's up to $100,000. So, but if, if it exceeds $100,000, then you would just show the $100,000. It's not like that employee gets kicked out of the mix. You keep the employee in the mix, but it's that excess that would not be considered for purposes of the amount of loan that you get. The next topic relates to another question that came in. So we're talking about the maximum loan amount now, and that's on page five, and it's two months of the church's average monthly payroll costs from the last year, plus an additional 25% of that amount. And the question is, will receipt of the loan cause church members or attendees to stop making contributions? It depends upon how you characterize this particular loan when you talk to your congregation. Um, but I think emphasis should include that it's for a limited amount of money and it's for a specific purpose. So I think if you make it very clear that it's not like the government's gonna come in and pay everything, then uh, your receipts um, from your attendees shouldn't go down. I think, you know, there are gonna be enough issues related to what comes in just because of now the distance you have between your attendees and for example, even on a Sunday, the distance when you give the long distance sermon rather than an in-person sermon. So, so that would be my comment on that. Uh, as far as interest rate, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Act says one thing, but the U.S. Treasury Department has now established um, half a percent fixed rate, so it doesn't change during the term of the loan. So that's obviously advantageous. The interest accrues from the time that you get the money. Um, that doesn't mean you have to start making loan payments as soon as you get the money. So loan payments are deferred, but the interest you will pay, um, that is not forgiven. Only the principal is forgiven if you follow the rules. And the term of the loan is two years. If you want to prepay it earlier, you can do that and there would be no fees. If you get a PPP loan, then you are not entitled to an employee retention credit. Consensus is that 
everyone will go for a PPP loan. And they have considered that most people will say, hey, the employee retention credit is of less value, so we're not going to go that route. The reason I've included it here is because if you don't get a PPP loan for some reason, let's say you weren't quick enough to apply, or they suddenly do say churches don't qualify, or if they run out of money by the time they get to your loan application, well then this is your fallback position. So certainly come back to this as your plan B. That's how I, I view it. Now, on page six, we talk about the forgiveness of the loan. And again, it's the principle that is forgiven, um, but basically you can sort of call it free money from the government. So it becomes a grant. You can consider it in those terms. Um, and I've listed what is forgiven, but you can see that it really lines up with what you've used in your application. So you're saying, hey, here's what we're going with and here's what we need to cover. And then if you in fact, you know, use it for those purposes, then that's the portion that is forgiven. Um, now you'll see there's a big and uh, two thirds down the page. So it's not only the categories, but also the main purpose is that employee and compensation levels are maintained. So um, this gets into the niceties of um, how you need to then uh, maintain your level of employment and staffing um, and their compensation levels. So rather than cut their compensation or decrease staff, the whole purpose here is if, if you've let people go, you can rehire them and bring your, your staffing back up to what it was before. So you want to analyze this as to your specific facts and see how that would work for your church. If you've already laid someone off, can you rehire them? Or what are your plans on that front? Or filling that position if someone has moved away and you can't rehire them, then someone to fill that spot. So each church pattern or structure will be different. And I realize that, but here are the guidelines at least as to how you will analyze your own church situation. If you can't do what this is describing, then don't waste your time to apply for one of these loans. But if you are able to do it, and this will give you the money to do it, then that's what's being offered here. I will make one other comment. If you don't think you can do it, um, but it still makes sense for a partial forgiveness or not even being forgiven as a loan, then, then it might still make sense to apply for the PPP loan. So if you're not sure, then go ahead and apply anyway, because um, there's still benefits of having a PPP loan. Um, I'm going to get to that on the next page. But first, I want to bring your attention to a couple other things here on page six. So um, a question was raised. If a balance sheet doesn't show dedicated funds, is that going to enter in and become a problem? Uh, is there a chance then that the loan won't be forgiven? I don't see that as being a problem because Again, the focus is on payroll and those actual expenses, so the ongoing workings of the church. And it would be apples to apples. So if you didn't have to include that information in the application, then you certainly don't have to include it when you make your request for forgiveness. Um, throughout where I make notes. Um, these are just my ideas. It's nothing I've read anywhere. But um, a note I make here on page six is, I think the smart idea is to have a checking account where you put in the money that you get from the loan and then carefully use that loan money through that account 
to pay out directly for the permitted categories. So then you can show very easily that the money you got was used for the purposes that it was intended. Um, then it's sort of like a, almost even a, a ledger because you'll have those checks to, to show that the money was directly used for that purpose. Okay, so page seven is reduction in forgiveness. So if in fact, you don't get the church back up to the pre-decline levels by June 30, which is the deadline, then you haven't lost out entirely on forgiveness. There's gonna be a reduction in the amount of your forgiveness, but certainly it was worth the try and certainly at least some of that money will be what I would call a grant. So that's gonna be a good thing. Um, so give it a shot anyway. Um, it, it's sort of a loan where there's no downside to it. And then number 15 on page seven basically says if a portion or, or not all of it is forgiven, then you still have the opportunity to hold on to that money or use that money. It would have a 10 year term and it would be at 4% interest. And that's not a terrible interest rate. Um, so um, it's just an alternative way you might look at the PPP loan if you're not gonna return to pre-decline levels. Now, you will have to request the forgiveness. Um, so there will be request forms and the government and, and lenders are always good about forms. So you will have to fill out a form. Um, they haven't, they've been focusing on the application form from what I can tell. They haven't focused on the request for forgiveness form yet. Now I make a note that it may not be the original lender. So some lenders may make these loans, but then turn them over to servicing companies or other lenders to do the servicing. So whoever's doing the servicing of the loan at the time will be um, the entity to which you submit the request. And the request will show uh, the number of full-time equivalent employees and pay rates and payments on eligible mortgage, lease, and utility obligations. Uh, and there will be a certification that it's all true and accurate. The lender then has 60 days to make a decision as to whether all of that is forgiven or not. The program is retroactive to February 15. Uh, so again, workers who have been laid off can be brought back onto the payrolls. Each church is limited to one PPP loan. Um, that's logical anyway. And as I mentioned earlier, the loan payments are deferred. Um, and so here the US Treasury, rather than just going with what the act said, which was six to 12 months, the US Treasury has come out and just set it at six months. So that was, again, information that just came out on Tuesday. I'm on page nine. Um, the church is allowed to have other loans, so you can get loans from other sources, or if you already have loans, that's fine. It doesn't affect the PPP loan program. Because of the amount of time we have for this webinar, I'm not going to go into the employee retention credit. Uh, I think it's spelled out well enough, uh, but again, if you don't get a PPP loan, then I do recommend you take advantage of the employee retention credit. And then another uh, benefit or, or opportunity is on page 10, which is the deferment option for payment of church's share of FICA taxes. And again, if you've got a PPP loan, you don't get this, but if you don't get the PPP loan, then might as well take advantage of the deferment option if you wish. The next category on page 10, letter E, is possible help to clergy family members or parishioners, and maybe even possibly former church employees. There's an expansion of unemployment insurance eligibility called the Pandemic Unemployment Assistant Program. And I think it's pretty well spelled out here. So 
um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into it in detail. I'm just going to hit a couple of points I think that are important. On page 11, number four, the amount of the benefit will be the normal applicable amount plus an additional $600 per week funded by the federal government. And then number five, duration of the unemployment benefits is extended up to a maximum of 39 weeks. Former church employees, um, number six gets into the issue of whether or not uh, this program would apply if the church itself had not participated in a state's unemployment insurance system. So some churches do participate in the state unemployment insurance system and some don't from my understanding. And so there's no answer to this question yet. That means that this will probably be very specific as to a particular church and a particular employee. So each fact pattern will have to be analyzed in the context of, of all of this information here. Uh, number 12 is what you've probably seen the most about in the news because this is money going back to US residents. Um, and so for most residents who have an adjusted gross income up to $75,000, um, they're going to get the $1,200 rebate and married couples of 150,000 AGI or less will get the 2,400. The way it's going to be, and there's additional money per child, and the way it's planned is that the IRS will put the rebate right back into a person's checking account if they've got that already on record. So that will be the quickest way. If they don't have it on record, then it will be a check and that will take a while. Uh, some other individual provisions I thought might be helpful. Uh, waiver of the 10% early withdrawal penalty for distribution of up to $100,000 from qualified retirement accounts for coronavirus-related purposes made on or after January 1, 2020. Um, so an example would be a job loss because of um, the pandemic. You know, these days, virtually all of us are affected by the pandemic. So, so it would be very broadly construed as to someone taking that kind of withdrawal. Now, if you don't have to take it, then it's smart not to, because once you take that money out, you, if your account has gone down in value, obviously you're then realizing or recognizing a hard loss on that money. And that money won't be in there to go back up when the stock market or other investments go back up in value. Um, so that's a word to the wise. There's also an increase in the amount available for a loan from your qualified retirement plan. And that's an increase from $50,000 to $100,000. And again, you're taking a loan out from probably a lower uh, plan amount. So, so again, to have the money come out, something has to be, quote, sold so that that money can be taken out. So if you can avoid it, then certainly do so. But this is a way for people who really need the money to get it for emergency purposes. There's also a waiver of the required minimum distribution rules. Um, so those who are 70 and a half, 70 and a half already take or more already taking them out, get sort of a, an extension on that. And of course, there's another law that changed it for those who haven't started taking it. Now the age is 72. And so if they otherwise would be 72 and have to start, then they're also getting um, a waiver on that front. As to charitable contributions, and this affects hopefully those of your parishioners who would want to give money, 
uh, it encourages Americans to contribute to churches and charitable organizations in 2020. So even if a taxpayer doesn't itemize deductions, they can still deduct up to $300 of cash contributions. Um, you might want to let your members know that so that uh, that might be a reason for them to suddenly um, focus on getting you money during these hard times to help the church through on the economic front. And also there are increases on the limitations on deductions for charitable contributions by taxpayers who itemize such as corporations. And for individuals, um, the limit of 50% of AGI is suspended for 2020. So those who are being generous individuals can give even more. For corporations, the limitation of 10% is increased to 25%. Another thing you've probably heard about in the news is the filing deadline and payment deadline for tax returns has been changed to July 15. Um, and also estimated tax payments uh, have the same kind of flexibility now. Uh, and this might affect the pastors who do do estimated tax payments. Education, um, here are some rules about student loan repayment and some benefits there. Um, so I've outlined that, um, but because of time, I'm not gonna go through that in particular. And on page 15, we have foreclosure. Uh, we got moratorium on that and forbearance. And I think that's pretty well spelled out in the written materials. Um, so I'm gonna just skip on over on that front to page 17. Um, you may be aware that you do need for the future purposes a real ID for traveling. And that had a deadline that's now being extended to October 1, 2021, instead of October 1, 2020. The reason for that is um, obviously we can't just run over to the DMV and, and get one of those these days. As to utility shutoffs, that's going to be regulated by each state, but there will be opportunities there. So if your parishioners have any concerns, they should be directed to their state utility. On uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act, um, this has um, some benefits and is specifically geared again toward the uh, results of coronavirus. Basically, ex it extends leaves. It gets into emergency paid sick leave on page two of this second section. Uh, and it's broadly uh, defined again. So it doesn't have to be someone who has COVID-19. It can be some who, someone who's indirectly affected by COVID-19. Uh, caring for someone or uh, being quarantined until it's determined whether they have COVID-19. So all the various reasons make a person eligible under this particular act. It also gets into health plans on page four of this section and taxes. Getting into some other submitted questions on page five, is a charge conference required for a PPP loan? We've concluded that um, because it's not a mortgage loan, a charge conference is not required. Um, the Board of Trustees should still um, follow its current practices as far as meeting and, and voting on this, um, but certainly uh, then as long as there's agreement amongst the Board of Trustees of the church, then the PPP loan application is authorized and appropriate. On page six of this second part, um, there's questions about 
how to have meetings and voting when we're all operating off site. Um, there are differences between California, Arizona, and Nevada law. And so we looked at it and first as to emailing really isn't doable in Arizona and California for voting purposes. Um, so, so that's a no. Um, but Nevada um, is worded differently in its statutes. So there, if members are present and communicate sequentially with one another, email voting is possible if you follow those rules. As to teleconferencing or Zoom type meetings, um, that actually satisfies the definitions of present in Arizona, California, and Nevada. So that looks like a good avenue for our current purposes. Um, and then depending upon your state, you know, if you wish to, you can read about your specific state there on the following pages. Um, that takes us the next to page 15 uh, about clergy penitent privilege online. And certainly um, that's what would be happening these days. Are there issues about privacy? Um, we've pretty much concluded that if you're zo using Zoom, for example, um, there is encryption. So that keeps out any bad actors or hackers. So it's not problematic. And then as to the type of communications, as long as the parties themselves have an intent to preserve confidentiality and privacy, um, then it's fine to use the online platform. As to uh, a situation where someone other than the clergy member or the penitent walks in. Um, as long as the parties involved show that they did not knowingly allow someone to listen in, then the privilege is not waived. So it's still appropriate. Um, so you can read more about that, but let me move on next to the question about clergy-based compensation on page 19. Here the question is basically, can a member of the clergy waive his or her claim to minimum compensation under the conference rules? Um, the answer is no. Uh, the Book of Discipline uses the verbiage of shall and for clergy receiving his or her compensation. And shall, when we interpret that, is mandatory. There is a waiver of a minimum salary addressed as a specific exception for missionary conferences. So in that situation, it would be a yes. But because the Book of Discipline specifically takes that out as an exception, that means even more so that the Book of Discipline did not mean that the general rule is that there can be um, any kind of exception for the rest of you. As to daycare centers, the question here related to an Arizona daycare center. And as most of you are probably aware, Arizona uh, had a stay at home order effective at 5 p.m. on March 31. Now that order is vague as to whether a daycare can still continue to care for the children of essential employees. And so this is not specifically covered by the stay at home order. Uh, the six rule, six foot rule for social distancing is impractical for childcare. So what it comes down to is um, I think it's best in any of the states to first check with the state and county health departments to see if they have concerns or um, guidance as to what you can or cannot do. Um, also, 
we all need to take into consideration Bishop Bob's March 31st letter, um, which speaks to um, children or others together uh, who might promote the spread of the virus as a public health concern. So the way I read his letter was, um, to the greatest extent possible, we should avoid that togetherness at this point in time. The next question related to penalties uh, for hosting groups. Uh, and at the time, the question related to the Phoenix coronavirus measures that came out March 19, 2020, and uh, the Phoenix mayor's emergency declaration about restaurants uh, having to turn to delivery and takeout and drive through and the changes about Trump, Trump's advice, President Trump's advice about groups of 10 or less. Um, and at that time, there were no legal duties or penalties in place for any of that. But as I said earlier, yesterday, we did hear that the Arizona Attorney General has categorized the uh, now order of the governor uh, as being one that would be subject to a penalty of a class one misdemeanor if it is violated. So as time goes along, I'm sure we'll hear more about penalties and uh, what the different states, organizations, both state level, perhaps federal and local, uh, might come out with to make sure we all protect ourselves in this public health crisis. Okay, um, Jody wants to know, Marilee, um, can you summarize a, a timeline or a process that we should follow from this point forward? Um, I'm assuming maybe prioritizations. Um, so generally, I'll ask, that's a pretty all-encompassing question. How, how should they deal with do we prepare and submit? Okay, as it relates to the, the PPP loan. I think the action steps would include the following. I think first you want to identify which lender is going to get you processed the quickest. And again, that might be an existing lender with whom you have a, a relationship. And find out what paperwork will be needed. Then second, um, with all that information at hand, then the Board of Trustees should determine who's gonna be doing the application and signing the application. And then uh, third, um, the church staff should get together the paperwork that also is needed to be uh, sent in with the application. So the application and supporting documents should be prepared and submitted hopefully as early as tomorrow or as soon thereafter as possible. There's a question about, and it's okay to have a church conference via Zoom for any purpose, including uh, if they wanted to refinance their mortgage loan or something like that, is that correct? Yes, as long as your particular state rules are followed, um, then that would be appropriate. Okay. You want to exercise care um, to make sure you have a record of who's in attendance and make sure that for book of discipline purposes, you've done proper noticing. So when I refer to state law, um, that's not the whole picture. You would, of course, follow the book of discipline as to the other rules as far as noticing, etc. Uh, but then, yes, it would be doable. Can a um, church hold a live stream service from their sanctuary with the bare minimum of staff? Um, or does that violate the stay at home? Or do they qualify as an essential service? So there, there are two answers to that question. And I'm going to let Marilee answer the legal aspect of that. And then I know a couple of our district superintendents are on. Maybe I could call on Susan Brims or Nat Nancy Cushman to answer the um, uh, 
pastoral part of that. We really need to turn to what the particular state is defining as essential. So for example, we just now got uh, Governor Ducey's list of essential, and it was pretty broad. Um, it includes lawyers and golf courses, but I don't think it included churches. So I, I'm reluctant to say that you can put it under that category as far as uh, essential. As far as gatherings of people, um, I think I'd emphasize uh, respecting social distancing requirements. I know what's been bandied about the most is six feet, but yesterday I was hearing that that might be changed to 10, at least in nursing homes. So those things are changing day by day. So you need to, you know, watch the news and, and be attentive to those new rules too. But yes, what do the district superintendents yeah. say? And actually, I just got uh, Bishop Bob, you're here. If you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and answer the question for us. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I've been uh, responding to people who have asked this question with this comment. Uh, as, apart from what the legal aspect is, I think our moral uh, obligation is to do whatever we can to protect our people. And uh, I continue to uh, insist that we uh, stop doing um, the recording of, of worship services with even two people in the sanctuary. Someone asked yesterday, is it okay if a uh, uh, senior pastor and associate pastor and the videographer are in the sanctuary? My response was no, because of the dangers, the continued danger of exposure of being with someone who uh, has been exposed or is um, asymptomatic uh, but carrying the virus, uh, as well as the danger of touching um, and being in contact, I think we are safer if we, uh, for the immediate time, uh, cease all of that and, and uh, lean on our uh, technology to be able to record while we are separately in our homes where we're safe and healthy. In light of that, I also um, wanted to mention that uh, at least Governor Ducey was saying if people need to go to work, they can go to work. And so based upon what Bishop Bob just said, it's possible that, for example, a senior pastor could go to the church office and use the equipment there to do the recording and streaming. Yeah, I think in the, the order there was religious um, nonprofits. Um, so you, you could maybe interpret it very loosely, but um, well, the greater moral obligation. <laughs> the, the parts that I saw related to those who were actively doing things for like the homeless, et cetera, which right certainly we would fall under. I don't know if that's true of like online sermons. So right. that's why I'm cautious in that category. Is that something that would fall within that definition as an essential service? Yeah, fair enough. I guess we would argue yes. <laughs> um, but, but Bishop Bob, um, I think has stated what our conference position is. Okay. Um, we're switching back to a question on the PPP loans um, on calculating the full-time equivalents. Um, church has a preschool that they've laid people off and um, asking can they exclude those or any way to only count the you know, church and not the daycare. My understanding is no, I'll let you, dis that they are going to have to factor that in because you're going to have to come up with your 12-month average payroll, and that would include how many of our full-time equivalents that was, and that then you would have to compare how many full-time equivalents you had after the 
eight weeks that you use the money for to see what portion of the loan is forgiven. I, I didn't see a way to start the clock ticking on full-time equivalents after layoffs had occurred. Would you agree or do you have a different interpretation? Okay, so the time period is pretty set in stone and I agree with your characterization. If it's a preschool that is basically captured by the church and the church is responsible for those salaries, then absolutely yes. Now, what I've come across is some preschools are incorporated separately as independent preschools or daycares, even though they're on the church campus. And so then I would say that's a situation where the church payroll is just the church payroll because that separate corporate entity has its own payroll and they do their own tax reporting, et cetera. Do you agree with that, Randy? Yes, I, I would agree. Another slightly different question related to the PPP. If you're in a position where you have um, some cash reserves or some investments that, you know, so you're not destitute, you can still make payroll, but you've obviously had a reduction in those quite significantly if they're invested in any sort of market-based. Um, can you still apply for the loan? Can you say straightforwardly that you've been impacted negatively by COVID, which you just have to attest to? My reaction would be absolutely. Sure. You don't have to go broke. To <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. And I don't think you have to feel morally bad about doing that. You know, you're trying to preserve um, the church's assets as much as possible. Next question gets back to the meeting notice. Um, if you're having a, if you can do it by um, still the Zoom, do they still have to give the same notices that they had to, um, or if you're going to have a charge conference, you know, the two Sundays before? Are there the same legal notices, even though you're going to conduct the meeting in a not, not in an in-person way, do you still have to follow the same notice requirements in the book of this? Yes, if it's going to be a church or charge conference, yes, you'd still have that two-week period of time. Right. Okay. Back to the PPP, there's a question on can uh, utilities be included in the loan just as payroll? Um, the answer, as I understand it, is not in calculating the amount of the loan. It's the lesser of $10 million or two and a half times your average monthly payroll. But in what you use those funds for, you can include utilities. It's um, the guidance I've seen is that non-payroll costs like mortgages, interest, utilities can't be more than 25% of the total. But um, so it doesn't impact the calculation of the loan amount, but yes, it can be used to some extent um, to spend the money that you get from the loan. Is that your understanding as well, Marilee? Yes. Uh, what about mobile food pantries and the stay at home? <laughs> food pantries are obviously in the exempted essential services. but Yeah, I think legally they're permissible, um, but I would defer to Bishop Bob as to our conference position. Well, I think it's pretty clear that we have some pretty uh, stringent requirements for uh, food pantries. I think the mobility causes another uh, uh, wrinkle if it is moving from place to place to place. So uh, in that case, you know, what gets touched, um, wh whether there is a contact, it's a little harder to control. And I don't, uh, I don't know whether mobile uh, food pantries can uh, create a, a different a pattern if, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know how these work. Um, if they're going throughout the neighborhood, maybe we need to change that so that we're, um, we are more stable uh, rather than uh, having the 
the mobile food bank travel all over. I think the more we can, uh, we can uh, find a, a place or two maybe where we're going to be and not uh, travel a lot, uh, it makes it easier for us to clean uh, and uh, disinfect and to uh, limit the number of uh, volunteers, et cetera, that we come in contact with. The, the guidelines that we have um, uh, related to uh, food banks is, uh, I think has some good, uh, good information that will help be very helpful, but let's try to keep our mo mobility uh, within a reasonable um, uh, number of stops, for example. Thank you, Bishop. Um, a fairly specific question again, back to the PPP loans. If a church takes out, uh, gets a loan, and it's totally forgiven, will they still be responsible for interest, or is that is the interest only accrue on the portion of the loan that is not forgiven? Do you know the answer to that, Marilyn? Uh, interest is never uh, forgiven, so you will pay for the interest. It's the principal that's forgiven under that scenario. Okay, and the interest clock starts ticking from the funding date of the loan. Correct. Okay. So that's something to keep in mind, you know, and that's 4%, right? Well, no, it's a half a percent under the U.S. Treasury information. Oh, okay. Half a um, if it's not, if the loan is not forgiven, then it would be at 4%. Got gotcha. you. Forgiven, it's a half a percent. So there is a difference there. All right. And All right. that's my understanding from what I saw on Tuesday. Again, things change from day to day, but that's the difference. That makes sense. So there is quite an advantage, even in interest, of getting the loan forgiven. So. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Church has its own EIN and pays personnel costs out of its own checking account, but it's not separately incorporated as a 501c. A letter from GCFA establishes it as part, so it's covered by the group exemption. Would the church and the preschool apply together or separately? My understanding would be separately since they have separate EINs and that's on the application form. Would you agree with that or not? Yeah, yes, that makes sense. Okay. Um, and that would be the same if uh, not just a school, but a foundation or any other ministry that had its own separate EIN. That, that's the critical determining factor. Yes, correct. If we wanted to, if a church wanted to move forward with applying for an SBA loan, could they do that immediately? I don't think there's any requirement as far as X number of days notice to have a trustees meeting to approve that, but I'm aware of it. Correct, yeah. Uh, usually the Board of Trustees is pretty flexible and able to meet quickly, so that's what I'm anticipating. Yeah, as long as it's not by email. <laughs> Correct, in the two states that don't allow it. In Arizona, right, okay. I guess I'm gonna have to stop doing these email votes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we didn't hear that. <laughs> yeah. Bishop Bob had encouraged me to ask this question, and it's probably just a clarifying of something that Marilee already looked at, but our daycare has still been in operation because we serve hospital personnel, and we're only two blocks from the hospital, so we serve quite a few. We also have some other families who qualify as essential. Um, they're in a, essential categories. We daily contact the Maricopa Health Department to make sure we're following all of the current guidelines. In fact, we exceed them. Um, and we just want to make sure that we're doing the right thing and that we're, we're covered with that. Um, our families are relying on us and the hospitals are relying on those families, um, those nurses and so forth. But I just wanted to, to verify that we're in the clear. I know the thing from the governor most recently was not as clear as one might want. But if people are okay to drive to childcare, then you ought to be okay to have the childcare they're driving to, um, logically. Um, the previous order did say childcare for families that are essential workers was also essential. So just wanting a little more reassurance, I guess. I'm okay with that. Bishop Bob, are you okay with that? 
Yeah, I, uh, my hesitation was, uh, I, I don't want us to be in a position where people, uh, people uh, who are healthcare workers uh, don't have a place for their uh, children. So that's essential, and I understand the governor's position. W uh, the place that I want us to be careful is, I, I think, uh, in, in addition to the stringent uh, precautions that you mentioned, Anne, and I think your list is, is comprehensive, um, I, I don't want us to get to a point where people are pointing to you and saying, how come you get to have this and I don't. So, you know, we need to be clear that this is for, this falls within the guidelines of, of pr providing daycare for essential workers. And then we want to be um, clear uh, that people aren't able to say, well, my, my cousin also needs daycare, yeah, you know, and, and that kind of, um, uh, it's hard for us to say no, but sometimes having to say no to, to, to these situations is important. So, it's um, it's incumbent upon you to be sure that you stick to the guidelines that this is only for this a group of people who are deemed essential. That was my my concern. And we have sent numerous letters to the, all of our families saying, if you are not in an essential category, stay home. And if you or anyone in your family is sick, stay home. Um, whether the child is sick isn't the issue. If anyone in the household is sick, they are to stay home. And uh, we also don't, I mean, we've got a whole list of things and if somebody wants the list of what we've implemented, uh, feel free to email me and I'll send it to you. Uh, the, the other question I have is, do you have put into place sort of like uh, a statement about the tipping point? I mean, at what point do you close the daycare? Uh, we have told them if anyone who is one of the families of the that we serve, or if any of our employees actually test positive, we will close for a minimum of 14 days. Um, even if we don't know of anyone having been on property, if there's someone who has been, you know, in this, the stream of contact, we will close. Um, I mean, that's slightly dicey with the healthcare workers. We know some of them are going to be in contact with people, but we've also implemented um, Drop-off procedures now do not involve parents coming on campus. They're being met at the gate by one of the, actually by two of the teachers, one who signs the parent in and one who takes the child back. So the parents who are actually working at the hospital are not coming on campus. The back to the PPP loans is the annual payroll where average monthly cost, payroll cost on a calendar basis for 2019 or is it on 12 months, for example, ended March 31. Um, I haven't seen that it's specifically required one way or the other. Most of the examples I've seen in webinars are that um, people will use 2019 just as because it, it's um, easy and readily available. Would, do you know anything differently, Marilee? No, that sounds perfectly appropriate. Another question, just confirming that email vote is not allowed in Arizona, which you said. How can we permit a non-mobile food bank to operate in compliance with legal mandates and at the same time strictly prohibit live streaming of a Sunday worship that involves fewer people with greater social distance separation? Just because food banks are listed as essential services and worship isn't, is that just of it? So, so Steve, and I might jump in here too and say that I'll refer you back to the Bishop's earlier answer regarding uh, food pantry um, and worship. And just uh, we're posting some links here to help people connect to information that has been shared. I know you've asked if every pastor has received the guidance and we have, um, and we have posted the guidance online. I'll let Marilee though answer the question about essential versus non-essential service. Yeah, I agree with Randy on that as far as um, how essential services are defined. Um, so food banks are geared toward the homeless and the hungry. Um, and that's a very direct thing that we can prove. Worship services, um, although they do have benefits for the same people, uh, that's not as direct, so that's harder to prove. 
Um, I just want to thank you so much, Mary Lee, yeah. for the presentation today, but for the reference materials. And Beth, I'll turn it back to you. In addition to this webinar and the um, you will and the chat will be entering the questions you've entered into the chat onto a document that you can download from our website. Um, you're also going to be able to access this information on our conference website. Uh, if you go to our homepage and click on how to worship online or uh, DSC University training events and resources, let's do that one you will see that a screen pops up that invites you to our page that has all kinds of training on it. And the first box is DSC webinar and community conversation resources for churches during COVID-19. That will take you specifically to our webinar resources. Here you can see we've already posted the loan application that Randy shared, version three. We'll continue to update that as we can. The outline from um, Marley today has been posted. Uh, links for the Small Business Administration, as well as the text of the CARES Act, all kinds of different things, including GCFA's uh, resources for COVID-19. That's the General Council on Finance and Administration and um, their information on the CARES Act. That's all accessible right here. Um, lots of you have asked some questions about, well, what about this uh, particular type of meeting? Um, we, we've covered or tried to cover most of those types of questions in our FAQ document. Uh, you can get to that FAQ document from just about anywhere on the website. Um, we try to talk to you about recording, memorial services, weddings, daycares, food banks, shelters, 12-step groups what to do about Holy Week. Um, we're just trying to keep this document up to date with all the information you keep asking. If there is a desire for another type of webinar that we haven't been able to offer yet, we invite you to go to webinar requests and just click here and share that with us. Um, and all of our webinars that we have offered are available. Yeah. So our community conversations from last week how to take your church fully online, more about the kinds of technology you need and alternatives to online for church. Uh, we have all of that information available here. So we hope you'll take advantage of that.